Kurt, I mean, I, I always appreciate talking uh, with you and I brought you on, um, you know, this week because I wanted to ask you a very simple question. Is Mexico's democracy in danger? <laughs> and, and for listeners, if you haven't been paying attention, things have been getting very, very wild in Mexico. Go back to 2018, where in the presidential election, AMLO wins the presidential election, beating his opponent by a sizable margin, by the way. Um, in 2021, there is a boycott, uh, uh, sorry, the right boycotted another referendum that AMLO wins um, on his presidency. And AMLO's approval ratings have stubbornly stayed above 60% in the country. But despite AMLO's popularity and the fact that he continues to win elections, <laughs> if you read the American press, dictatorship is brewing in Mexico. A highly popular democratically elected president is governing. So to talk about this more in depth, I think there's no one better. And if you all see here, um, it's, it might not be super clear for you all, but that green line is AMLO's popularity um, over these past few years. And you might not be able to see, but over 60%, which would be amazing by American standards for a president to be able to hold that. Um, but to talk more about this, we have Kurt Hackbarth, who is a journalist whose work you can read in Jacobin uh, joining us. Um, Kurt, how's it going? Uh, going good, uh, David. And, you know, <clears throat> the nerve of AMLO to continue to be popular despite the best attempts of the New York Times and the Atlantic Monthly, right? Uh, and, uh, and David, British David, NGOs. And David Frum. Like, let's remember, like, some of the people we're going to talk about, like, Barr, right? Trump's boy, David yeah. Frum. You should start to get worried when you hear the cast of characters who are starting to beat the drums on, on AMLO. Maybe to, uh, yeah, sorry, and to set this up really quick, uh, Kurt has yeah. a really great piece in Jacobin that y'all should all read. No, AMLO is not undermining Mexican democracy. Um, Kurt, I mean, I, I want to talk about a lot of things with you, but like, let's just start with this first bit. Sure. Could you tell people what the uh, National uh, Electoral Institute is, the um, INE, and um, what AMLO is doing around it and what seems to have all of these people in D.C. and, you know, in the New York Times and Atlantic office is so worried? Yeah, it turns out all of a sudden everybody's an expert, right, in Mexico's electoral system, and they're so very concerned about it. Um yeah, so a little bit of, of, of background uh, on this. Um, unlike the United States, you know, where elections are a federal matter, in Mexico, there's, um, Mexico is also a federal system, but there's a national electoral system that oversees elections, in theory. Uh, and this came about uh, through the reforms uh, of the late 90s. Um, and it, what was created was called um, the IFE, right, or the Federal Electoral Institute. Uh, which after the election of 2006 acquired the nickname uh, the Instituto de Fraude Electoral, the Electoral Fraud uh, Institute, um, which led to a series of reforms and then the IFE became, then became renamed as the INE. Right? Um, and now all of a sudden, you know, um, American publications and the Mexican right, uh, unable to win, you know, elections, let's let, here that um, AMLO won a landslide election in 2018 uh, and won control of both houses of Congress, something which was um, reinstated in 2021 when he held control of Congress again in the midterms elections. And then um, the, uh, the referendum that you mentioned uh, at the beginning, right? So what you have here is um, a right wing minority in the country, um, kind of <laughs> They're all in their trench there in, in the few areas of the government which they continue to control. One of them is the Electoral Institute, which has, you know, a conservative majority on its board. And they've tried to blow up a very minor electoral reform into a major issue of AMLO being an authoritarian autocrat and liberal democracy is at risk. And Mexico is, you know, about to become the next failed state, whatever else. I want to give a little bit of context here as well. <clears throat> First of all, this is a very, you know, it's it's a very minor reform. I talk about it in my piece. It mostly has to do with cost cutting, mm -hmm. do with um, there's a constitutional provision in Mexico that um, new that nobody can earn more than the president because Mexico has a long history of just exorbitant salaries at the federal level. Um, it kind of eliminates duplicate uh, functions between local and district level uh, electoral councils. 
Um, this is mostly what it does. And then there is actually some very good things uh, that it does. Uh, it facilitates voting rights for the disabled, those people who are in pretrial detention, which is important. You know, I think it's been a big struggle in the U.S. for mm -hmm. people who are incarcerated or formerly incarcerated to have uh, the right to vote. That's in this uh, electoral reform. And then the big thing is migrants living abroad, right? I mean, you know, Mexico is a country of migrants, right? And these people have never been able, even Mexican, you know, being Mexican citizens have been able to vote effectively, right? So the law takes uh, measures now to allow these millions of Mexicans uh, to be allowed to vote. Now, conservatives hate this because Mexicans abroad tend to vote for AMLO's party, Morena. That's just, you know, and so they're trying to make a big fuss about the fact that, well, these people don't have voting ID cards because in mm -hmm. Mexico, ID cards are mandatory. How could they vote with their passports? There's going to be all kinds of fraud. As if the INE, right, over its, you know, many, many years, it's 20 years in existence now, hasn't overseen its own set of frauds uh, and has looked the other way um, through mountains and mountains of, um, of corruption in elections. What they want you to believe from the New York Times and the Atlantic is that elections were perfect in Mexico until AMLO started tinkering with things. And that just goes against all kinds of, you know, that goes against <laughs> completely. No, I mean, <laughs> where do you even begin? Because no, I, it, one, it's very funny to hear from, and people like that, very, very concerned with the salaries of like bureaucrats, right? Because people who are very willing to wage war on that system in the United States somehow very, very worried that some people might be getting salary cuts and some redundancies might may be getting, um, you know, slashed in, in, in the Mexican system. But one thing that is very, very telling in a lot of these articles that have been coming out and like, in a second, I, I want to talk more broadly about like why you think there is such a uh, plethora sure. of these right now. Um, but one thing that is really, really interesting about like both some of the New York Times pieces and some of the Atlantic pieces that I've read is that they talk about um, AMLO's um, campaign in 2006, right? Um, and they try to make this connection to Trump's quote unquote, like stop the steal in 2020. I mean, could you talk a little bit for people who might not be familiar with like what happened in 2006 and why that might be a kind of sore spot for AMLO and for Morena? Yeah, 2006 was AMLO's uh, first presidential election. All right. Um, by all accounts, um, AMLO won that election and it was stolen by the then Federal Electoral Institute after, you know, all kinds of irregularities along the way, you know, uh, precincts where there were more votes than people registered precincts and then there were less. Um, the count uh, did really weird things um, the night of the election. And there was actually a very strange thing where when you have candidates that are that close, right, supposedly I'm the loss by a half a percent, the way the statistics would work, would you have one candidate ahead, then another one, then another one, then another one as precincts come in, if they come in randomly, right? That didn't happen that night. That didn't happen that night. The, the way the count worked was that um, they ensured that uh, Calderon would be ahead the whole time on the night of the election, right? So there was so many irregularities there that what Amlo said is, let's, let's have a recount. Let's have a recount. Sounds pretty normal, right? When we did it here? Yeah. <laughs> the law at that time was ambiguous on a recount, but if both sides had gone for it or if, the, if they had ordered it, it could have happened. They refused, and then they proceeded to burn the ballots. Mm. So it's funny now that you have people like Natalie Kitareff at the New York Times saying, AMLO accuses electoral fraud in 2006 and there's absolutely no evidence for that. Well, they burned the evidence. <laughs> they burned the evidence, right? And that's when the IFE got the nickname, the Federal, the Fraudulent Electoral Commission, right? The IFE, right? Mm -hmm. And that's these cosmetic changes to turn it into the INE. In AMLO's second election in 2012, right? AMLO's a very persistent a politician. His uh, opponent uh, for the PRI, Enrique Peña Nieto, at that point, they had then... Um, put in the law that there was um, a cap 
for spending for elections. And if you went over the cap, the election could be annulled and you know have to do a, another election. Peña Nieto spent tons of money in that election. Uh, according to a congressional analysis done later, 13 times over the spending cap, right? I mean, he was going everywhere in a private jet. He got money from this Brazilian company, Odebrecht, this construction job has been entangled in um, uh, corruption scandals across Latin America. Um, but, you know, the INE, see no evil, hear no evil, and they ratified the 2012 election as well. Uh, and the only person they tried to sanction for spending um, problems was AMLO, right? When, uh, when, when Peña Nieto um, did whatever he wanted with electoral law uh, in Mexico. So you get to the point now, and then there have been a series of other, you know, I mentioned uh, a series of scandals uh, in my article, right? Mm -hmm. uh, nobody else seems to know the history of the INE, right? They just think, oh, the INE oversaw the transition to democracy in 2000 because it handed power from one right-wing party to another. But when push came to shove in 2006 and 2012, and there was actually a center-left candidate in contention, oh, then the INE wasn't that, um, wasn't that uh, neutral anymore, right? And I think that's important because although David Frum doesn't mention these things or Ann Applebaum today in, in the Atlantic who came down and hung out with some rich people and went to a march, you know, and they went to brunch uh, and Mexico's a failed state. Um, the Mexican people know the history of mm -hmm. INE, right? They know the history of the INE. They know, for example, uh, what was called Operation Sapphire, when governors from the PRI diverted money from their state budgets into the electoral campaigns of 2016, right? Mm -hmm. People know about um, Operation Berlin, when they spent millions of dollars, uh, again, illegally, uh, in 2018. If you just saw the trial of Genaro Garcia Luna in, in New York City, uh, the former security minister, for Felipe Calderon, right, who, you know, was found to be guilty of colluding with the Sinaloa Cotel. One of the witnesses at that trial was a former finance minister, right, who said, oh, yeah, we diverted money from our state budget into campaigns and into media campaigns to make our politicians look good and to make Garcia Luna look good. Mm -hmm. Where was the INE? <laughs> Where was the INE for all of this? It was nowhere. It was nowhere to be seen. They were totally colluded with that, you know, pseudo two party system at the time between the PRI and the PAN. Right. And so <laughs> although American press doesn't want to talk about this history, people in Mexico know it very clearly. I, I mean, I think it's very clear that I mean, well, obviously, because it's in English, but like the, the audience is not a Mexican audience for these pieces. <laughs> it's the Beautiful. sort of lay the ground, um, you know, for for more hostile um, policy from, from Joe Biden. But like, I mean, even more, um, recently, I mean, like, could you talk a little bit about like, so all these other things were, were the INE is sort of like uninterested in acting in the defense of Mexican democracy. Um, could you talk about some of the recent targeting of Morena? Yeah. Um, so this has been one of the more recent problems for the, for, for the INE. Um, they've been in the midterm elections, um, in 2021, they disqualified two Morena candidates for governor in the states of Guerrero and Michoacan for the fairly minor, um, you know, peccadillo of not filing an expense report for their primary campaigns, right? Maybe they should find them, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's just this disproportionate act of, of um, disqualifying two people running for office in light of you know, the blind eye they turned to legendary corruption <clears throat> over the previous years. And there was a series of other Morena candidates who were disqualified as well. I think 49, not just those two candidates for governor. And it was targeted at Morena. More recently, <clears throat> the INE has decided now, um, they decided, took it upon themselves that they could now cancel people running for office last year for tweeting. For tweeting. Right. There was a, uh, a, a representative called Andrea Chavez. She made a very minor tweet there. Right. I said, all right, you can't run again because mm. this is violence, gender violence. Right. It's kind of the weaponizing of this. She's like, well, I'm, 
a woman. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there was a, a Morena senator in a debate in Congress who made a fairly anodyne comment about the opposition. The union went down on her. Um, there was someone who, a journalist who was trying to promote um, the referendum that we talked about for AMLO. And the union said, oh, you're sanctioned because only we can promote the referendum by law. So you have this kind of out of control in there that was obvious in deciding that we can cancel candidacies just for a tweet or because we decided as a private citizen to support uh, the campaign to try to promote participation uh, in a referendum or a plebiscite. So one of the things this electoral law does, is says, listen, Hine, you can't cancel people's political rights to run for office, right? Which is becoming a dangerous thing. Uh, and many in Morena feared that this was heading up you know, towards being used against the front runner for the presidential candidacy in 2024, who was, you know, Mexico City Mayor Claudia Scheinbaum. If they could cancel Andrea Chavez's candidacy, what couldn't they make up to just all of a sudden say to Scheinbaum, oh, you didn't file an expense report. Oh, you didn't cross, you know, a T or dot an I. You can't run for president. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting now that I think part of this campaign from the United States, um, you know, from and Kitarev and Applebaum and the like, seeing that Morena has a very large lead uh, heading into 2024 that hasn't eroded, is to find a way to pre-disqualify the 2024 election. And that to me is the most dangerous of all of this. You know? mm -hmm. Because of AMLO's relatively minor um, electoral reform law, you know, reducing salaries, reducing bureaucracy, uh, clipping the wings of the INE, uh, you know, to cancel people's uh, political rights and such, all of a sudden, the 2024 election is not going to be trustworthy or fair. So an opposition that has proven that it can't win elections since 2018, mm -hmm. now has, they can say, this election is, is, is flawed from the outset, we're not going to recognize it, and the U.S. press <clears throat> will play along with us. I think that's very, very, very dangerous stuff. I mean, I mean, I, I totally agree. And I think that, you know, th this is like going up to what we were talking about at the beginning of the show. We were talking about some of the stuff happening here in Austin with policing, where like it's very advantageous for the right to sort of operate in these like context free zones. Right. Because like right. what's told to the American reader is like Omlo is super scary and he talks to the press every morning, which is somehow dangerous and bad um <laughs> answers and, questions <laughs> answers questions and says what he thinks about things um and you know he's challenging like the electoral authority um in mexico when uh, upon further analysis it's very very clear that all of this kind of thing is like I mean, liberals in America love this concept, too, of like things that stand outside of politics. Right. That's why, like, it's been very hard to sort of break their reverence for the Supreme Court, uh, despite the way that the Supreme right. Court <laughs> very much expressed itself as a political institution. Um, you know, but it's, it's very, very clear in, in, in Mexico that over the past few few, I mean, the past few years, like, you know, it, it, that, that, that this is not an, a, a neutral body. This is a body that is playing politics <clears throat> that represents a site of power for a right that can't beat AMLO and this new coalition. That's right. In That's right. So they're trying to hold on to it against, again, like AMLO is the one who wins the election. The people are also electing members of Morena. This is what they're wanting to do uh, with the system to make it more democratic, to make it more open, to prevent the right, the vestiges of the right wing from basically being able to haunt the future. Um, you know, it's just like you can't beat them. So they're trying to create this false narrative that democracy is under attack when it's very, very clear that, you know, one of the uh, of course that's actively operating against democracy is the email. Exactly right. And I think it's important to point out, David, that Morena is not going to fall into the trap of the Democrats, that when they have power, yeah. they don't do things that they should do. And then, you know, and then they're all, you know, so surprised when these things turn out against them later. Mm -hmm. right? So, you know, um, the Democrats didn't, you know, decided not to um, make, you know, make the Supreme Court larger or pack the Supreme Court. They decided not to fight when, you know, um, Obama's um, pick there um, was blocked and they didn't have a vote on it, right? Because it's always institutions and this and that. Morena is not that naive or kind of this faux naive, this faux naive of the Democrats. And they know that once you have a majority, you have to do these things. You can't 
to go by because that'll come back and bite you, right? The INE has proven <clears throat> that it is a partisan actor in Mexican elections. It is, right? Uh, and living very high on the hog, right? I mean, in a country where the minimum wage is $10 a day, you have these top counselors uh, making, you know, 13,000 US dollars a month, 250,000 a year, you know, for taxes, a bevy of benefits, cars, uh, meal budgets, uh, you know, phone budgets, uh, batteries of uh, advisors who all make more than the president. In a country this poor, it's just a slap in the face. It's an insult, right? And it's this old neoliberal idea from the 90s that you have to pay people exorbitant salaries in order to attract talent, uh, or otherwise uh, you won't have any anybody worth their salt in, you know, in the public sector, right? So it's always a very hypocritical argument from the conservatives. They want cost cutting, right? They think cost cutting is good, but not for them, not for their buddies, not to the people at the top. It's it's cost cutting for everybody else. Mm. Not when we try to enforce a constitutional provision that nobody can earn more than a certain amount, right? The lead, the head of the IFE, the two heads of the IFE actually went to court to try to prevent that constitutional amendment from applying to them. You think people don't see this? That instead of administering elections, they're spending time in court in order to try to prevent a constitutional amendment mandating a salary cap from applying uh, to them? So I think that's that that that's important as well. And I think Morena doesn't have this U.S. liberal worship, you know, this abstract worship of institutions. Yeah. I think they're not that dumb <laughs> because they've suffered so many frauds. 2006, 2012, mm -hmm. um, the 2017 state election in, 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 in the state of Mexico. I mean, it's just they've gone through this so many times, right? Well, and like, again, like... Um... <laughs> It's very, very um, bold of like a David Fromm, for example, to come in and speak for the voiceless uh, in Mexico. When we literally have examples of, of this, I mean, could you talk a little bit about these opposition rallies and then on those rally in Mexico City? Because it, I know we've had you on Left Reckoning to talk about, yeah. about, about these in the past, but a lot of these listeners might not be tuning in. So they should be tuning in to Left Reckoning. <laughs> That's right. Uh, <laughs> No, I mean, it was like it was two different worlds in your ability to mobilize people and and also two different worlds in the way that each was portrayed in the American media. Yeah. So um, the first main election, the uh, first main opposition march was in November of last year when they marched to save the Ine, right, um, in Mexico City. Uh, and what was amazing about it <clears throat> Um, you know, they certainly had every right to march, and it was, you know, a reasonably safe march. Um, first of all, the opposition marches <clears throat> in, in Mexico in general, and I'm sorry, but I have to say this, the opposition marches in Mexico are very white. I mean, they're very white. Not everybody, but they are, right? Because, unfortunately, these are very racially stratified societies, and the opposition tends to be just, you know, in a country that is more than 80% mestizo and indigenous, the opposition tends to be disproportionately white, right? Now, in that first march, they forced their, their help to go because it was Sunday, right? That's the one day that the servants of all these people get off so they can go and have at least one day to walk around in the park and get an ice cream before they have to go back and serve in all of these, you know, big houses in the rich parts of Mexico City. So they forced some of them to go along, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, but what's interesting was the degree of racism and classism at this first march. I mean, you'd hear things like they would call, you know, Morena uh, sympathizers Indians. Mm -hmm. They would literally call Morena sympathizers Indians. That is an insult in, in, in Mexico still, which goes back, of course, to the class stratification uh, of, of the colony, of colonial times, right? They would call them nacos, and nacos is the best translation is kind of... Um, I don't know, uh, kind of not redneck, but kind of um, people with poor taste, you know, people kind of, you know, I don't know what, what we'd call that exactly. Uh, they call them patarajadas. Patarajadas are people who have um, the soles of their feet split from walking barefoot or sandals, mm -hmm. right? So they, would, they were calling Morena sympathizers 
Indios, Nacos, and Patarajada. I mean, they weren't hiding it. <clears throat> it's At this other opposition march a few weeks ago, um, <clears throat> they were a little bit more tempered, but this was in the wake of the conviction of Garcia Luna, right? Which was huge news in, in, in Mexico that Felipe Calderon's head of public security, right? Felipe Calderon who stole the election in 2006, thanks to the IFE, his director of public security for six years was in bed with the Sinaloa cartel. Why is the U.S. media not talking about that with the same insistence that they're talking about the INE? You'd think David Frum would be talking about that. You'd think Natalie Kitreff would be talking nonstop about that. But they're talking about the INE. They're not talking about Garcia Luna. And I think that has a lot to do with, first of all, protecting former conservative governments. And also there's a degree of which that the United States was very complicit in that. So anyway, um, the opposition march was a few days after the conviction of Garcia Luna. And you saw these opposition marchers desperately trying to like rip down posters that said that Garcia Luna was guilty, right? Mm -hmm. It's like this guilt complex. There was a big um, sign in Mexico City of Garcia Luna guilty, Garcia Luna guilty. And they had the insignia of the conservative party, the PAN. They were desperately trying to rip this down. This isn't about Garcia Luna. This isn't about Garcia Luna. It's about the INE, even though the politicians in attendance at this march were the same politicians back in the time mm -hmm. that Garcia Luna or said nothing about it at the time. Now, um, <clears throat> the Morena March in November, and there's going to be another one on March 18th to celebrate the anniversary of the expropriation of, of the oil industry. Nice. It's a totally different thing. Um, first of all, it was much bigger, about a million and a half people. Uh, it was much more representative of Mexico, uh, racially and ethnically. And it was a fun march. I went to cover it. Um, it was fun. It was happy. Um, there were jugglers and there were people up on stilts and it was like kind of a festival atmosphere. Uh, people were singing. <clears throat> there were musicians. It was fun. You know, mm -hmm. uh, after so much suffering in Mexico, so much suffering, so much suffering. This movement is in power. This movement is in power. And they were they were celebrating that and they were having fun with it. That was, I think, the, the big difference. They weren't saying, you know, Indians. Yeah, yeah. Nacos and such. Well, and the big thing about that march is that Amlo marched with everybody. No security. Mm -hmm. <laughs> around it. He was getting pushed around. <laughs> it, it, again, like, you know, <laughs> you were there, which is it's it's it's, it's you know, it's great to 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 hear hear you and, and you shed some light on it because the way that was covered in America was as if it was like one of the darkest days in Mexican democracy, right? It's like the demagogue yeah. Amlo is, you know, sending his his minions to threaten like the society and the democracy of the country, right? Which again is like it's completely backwards. Where like they want to celebrate, you know, the white people's march. I'll I'll just be blunt about it. No, it's basically war. Um, and then oh, this darkening of Mexican democracy. Of you know, a little while after. I mean, it's really the dark skinned wrong. heathen mob. You know, <clears throat> hell bent on, on on destroying the country. Right? I mean, the whole point of a march is to show, like in public this is who supports this this is how many people support this right outside of an election this is a way to say this has popular support this movement has popular support this idea has popular support and for some reason when it happens in mexico when it happens when poor and working class people are doing it it somehow is like this threat and dark day instead of as you were saying it's like something that was very positive um and also like you know very clearly showing support um for this project yeah. Um, and I think it actually shows like how politicized, you know, Mexico has become over the years, talking to people there. Um, they knew exactly what was up, what was going on and what was what was what was in play there. Right. But these kind of marches uh, scare the elites mm -hmm. and they scare the kind of New York Times liberals who, you know, well, people, please think of the institutions, the institutions, you know, that gave those ignorant masses democracy and those institutions did nothing of the kind mm -hmm. they did nothing of the kind those institutions were full of people who went to american universities and have american degrees right uh, and charge exorbitant salaries right well 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 people here uh, suffer through in mexico city usually takes you 
two, two to three hours to get to work, two to three hours to go home. You've got to take the metro. You've got to take a bus, right? Um, it's, it's a difficult, it's a difficult life, right? Uh, and they just see these people, these institutions living so high on the hog and then just <clears throat> tossing one election after another in their faces over these 20 years. Like, ah, mm-hmm. all right. so they broke the rules, they broke the law, they overspent the, the salary cap. What are you going to do about it? And that was what people had to swallow for decades. What are you going to do about it? Right. And so this big idea in 2018 was, well, the INE let AMLO win. No, it didn't. But won by 30 points. Yeah. They overwhelmed the ballot boxes. It was it was too big to steal. Right. Um, the Tigre, the there's this old uh, idea that goes back to the Mexican Revolution, Porfirio Diaz, the dictator, when he was um, sent into exile to France. He's like, well, they've, they've awoken the tiger now. And the tiger is the Mexican public once they really, really, you know, mm-hmm. get upset. It's watch out for the tigre, right? And so they knew they couldn't do anything with, 30, with a 30 point, you know, they can steal it if it's within a stealable range, mm-hmm. right? So the INE didn't do anything. <clears throat> and I think that's very, very important for people to understand, right? Um, first of all, uh, Amal Morin have every right to pass laws because they have the majority, right? And then the second point, which I think is more than obvious, who is the United States to lecture anyone on elections? Yeah. I mean, you know, when the winner of the popular vote presidency in 2000 and 2016, when you have gerrymandering, when there are no election, when you can buy elections outright through dark money and super PACs, Mm -hmm. who the hell is the United States to lecture Mexico on anything? But they don't, you know, they don't see this because, and as I pointed out in my pieces, they don't care about Mexican elections. They don't care about Mexican elections. They've found an issue with which they think they can delegitimize AMLO. Like this idea insults the press, right? This idea, right? That they were on last year, right? Because he dares talk back to people who lie, right? So that's that's the thing here, you know? With Jeremy Corbyn, they kicked around and kicked around for years and finally found something that they could stick at him, right? So now AMLO, they kicked around, they kicked around, and now they finally found something they feel they feel will stick. They don't care about Mexican elections. They care about delegitimizing. Uh, a movement which has every indication that's going to be in power for quite a long time. Mm-hmm. The well, way things are going, at least another six years. Well, yeah, I mean, let, let, let's get into that a little bit because, like, I will say, like, <clears throat> one thing is, like, and maybe just because, like, I'm I, I'm I'm from Texas, so like, just geographically, I think about it a decent amount. It is wild how little coverage we get in this country about what's happening in Mexico. And like, I'm very happy to be a comrade and, and show solidarity to our friends in the United Kingdom when they're going through stuff. But it's wild to me how more closely, for example, like we follow UK politics or how accessible right, UK right. politics information Unless- is versus what's happening um, in, in Mexico. For the most part in Mexico, the stories you get are about cartels and, you know, about drugs, right? Um, but I, I have to ask, what do you make? Because this is not an isolated thing. Like, this is not just like one from piece, right? You had Barr in the Wall Street Journal with an absolutely like saber rattling kind of piece mm-hmm. in, in a lot of ways. You've had very, very critical cr- coverage in the New York Times, Atlantic, you know, across the board. Do you think there? I mean, is it just because the the INE is something that like the the upper middle class, the wealthy in Mexico are trying to use as their wedge issue to try to attack AMLO's project, or do you think there's some? You know, why is there such attention on on this right now? Why right now is there this mm-hmm. kind of rhetoric coming from this country? Well, I think you're right. It is a wedge issue with upper middle class uh, Mexicans who can then plug into upper middle class publications. Um, in, in the U.S., right? Mm-hmm. Historical role of the U.S. press in Latin America has always been to be a voice for these castes of upper class uh, people to head off even moderate reforms, mm-hmm. head off even moderate reforms. Let's recall that Latin America is, I think, um, the most unequal continent, you know, region in the world. And Mexico is one of the most unequal 
countries in the most unequal region. <clears throat> so you would think everybody would be laser focused on reducing inequality, right? I mean, that's, that's what we're talking about. I mean, it's, it's inequality within inequality, right? For one, you know, for one thing. Um, <clears throat> now, why now? I think is, is the question, right? Why the battery of pieces in the Times? Why the battery of pieces um, in the Atlantic? Why did they call him the tyrant of the year from this British NGO, right? <clears throat> Tied to the elements of the Labour Party over there and funded by the National Endowment for Democracy, just as opposition groups in, in Mexico are funded by the National Endowment for Democracy. And so why now? I have about three or four reasons. You know, <clears throat> one of them is energy policy. Uh, one of the big fights for AMLO uh, over his government has been to take greater control over energy policy, mm. right? Uh, up and against the greenwashers, you know, who are trying to kind of manipulate uh, a green discourse to keep private control of the grid, right? So now the whole argument was that, you know, AMLO loves dirty energy and loves oil and loves coal, even though Mexico just opened one of the largest solar projects in the world in Sonora, right? Um, so... The AMLO's energy reform law said, very simply, public sources of energy go in the grid first. And then if we need more, private sources can go in. But public energy goes in first. And that includes hydroelectric. That includes the Federal Electricity Commission's plants and the new sources um, they're, they're working out. They were totally up in our about that. Because before, Mexico's energy grid worked through a series of auctions. You had to auction energy, which are easily... Well, like what we have here, which is yeah. something that, you know, fails, by the way. Right. Um, and also provides very expensive electricity for working people. Exactly. And when, when when Texas fails, northern Mexico fails. Yeah, it's so true. Huge blackout a few years ago, that blacked out a big chunk of, of northern Mexico as well, right? So what's been interesting is to see as this energy reform progresses... Iberdrola having to hand over the keys to their plants because their their license ran out and the licenses aren't being renewed. These Spanish energy companies like mm -hmm. like Natergy, like uh, Enel, right? You've got a huge situation in the south of Mexico, for example, with these wind farms are literally on top of some of the poorest villages in Mexico. But the energy wasn't going to those poor villages. The energy was going to Walmart and Mitsubishi and the car companies, right? So <clears throat> that was one big thing, was taking control back of energy and uh, nationalizing lithium, which Mexico did last year. And that was just cemented um, a few weeks ago when um, Mexico launched its state lithium company, right? So energy independence is something the United States has never liked, mm -hmm. <laughs> right, ever. And the other thing is that Mexico is, you know, in its way, becoming a regional leader in, in Latin America. So you see an AMLO who saved Evo Morales when he was very likely going to be killed after the coup of 2019. They sent the plane for him. They got him out. Uh, you saw an AMLO who refused to go to the Summit of the Americas, right, last year, because all of the countries in Latin America weren't invited. Mm -hmm. you, they're going to invite you, but not you, and you, and not you. He said, all right, I'm not going to go. And the State Department flipped out. Uh, you see an AMLO who's called a spade a spade in Peru right now and said, that's a yep. coup. That's yep. a coup. And you've got Pedro Castillo uh, unjustly jailed. And the American ambassador, Lisa Kenna, former CIA agent, is advising the coup government. He said this at his press conference. And it's true. That's exactly what's happening. So, you know, going back to the Wolfowitz doctrine in the U.S., U.S. policy is designed to make sure that no country has a regional role of, you know, regional uh, leadership, right? Mm -hmm. You want to discourage people from, um, from aspiring to a greater regional role in the, you know, and take control over them. So that's one thing. Uh, I think another thing is the China pivot, mm -hmm. the famous China pivot. So the U.S. wants to bleed Ukraine dry, defeat Russia there, right, and then pivot to China and start a war over there. Um, and they're very upset that China is now has a big role in Latin America, right? Uh, I don't know if you've seen that map, but in the year 2000, you know, the U.S. was the biggest trading partner, I, th I think, of every country in Latin America. And now it's China mm -hmm. and every country except Mexico and two or three others. And China is now... You know, this whole nearshoring phenomenon post-pandemic 
uh, China and other Asian companies are opening uh, factories in Mexico, right? And so part of this is the extension of the Monroe Doctrine saying, no, no, no. You're still ours, Mexico. Mm-hmm. And especially now that they're set, you know, rattling sabers in uh, the Pacific ostensibly over uh, Taiwan. You know, it's like keeping Mexico on side. And if they're not going to stay on side nicely, well, then we'll we'll sick David from on you. Right. Well, um, this is this is a, a hit, Kurt, but I think it's it's worth doing really quick. I didn't have it all prepped up for us. So you'll you'll have to deal with my reading voice for a second. But this was a highlight of the front piece for me um, because uh, basically, you know, again, for people who don't know, like Mexico has a one term system for president. And like one of these things that you constantly get in these pieces is like Omlo, this dictator in waiting, might want somebody from his political movement to succeed him instead of the opposition. Oh, a, a hand-picked successor. Yes. So, let me just read this paragraph really quick from this David Frum piece in in the Atlantic, which was just like, I mean, y'all should read it to educate yourself, but I mean, it is it, it is garbage from the start. Um, like even like if I want to be cynical and maybe make a couple grand or something like that, I could write a better anti omlo <laughs> piece than this front one. It's just lazy. Um, or Jordan Peterson, he could do it in rhyme. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is from the front piece. Uh, the seeming paradox of all this effort by Lopez Obrador is that one of the enduring taboos in Mexican politics prohibits a president's reelection after a single six year term. Why try to manipulate an election in which he himself could not be a candidate? Yet there is a logic here, a logic of power. Lopez Obrador wants to ensure his succession by a completely loyal successor. By all accounts, he has identified such a person, the serving mayor of Mexico City, uh, uh, sorry, Mexico City, Claudia Scheinbaum. Right. And then he goes on to basically say that, like, no one would ever want to elect her. No one would ever want to support her. The the reason that AMLO is doing all this right now is basically to open up the path um, for them to win the, the next presidential election. Because again, AMLO acting <coughs> completely irrationally in, 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 in political science, uh, in, in the political science sphere, by trying to make sure that somebody who's a member of his party who might support yeah. who he supports is the person who's in power after his term's over. Yeah, I think we talked about that in the last on uh <coughs> reckoning as well right how how, how dare a president want someone from his party to win right <clears throat> and that humorous as it is just points to the double standard that exists here mm-hmm. something that is just so normal anywhere else right all of a sudden in mexico is dark and um autocratic right um and they don't You know, they don't see it, you know, passing laws with a majority, wanting your party to win, um, Mm -hmm. cutting costs. Maybe you could have more money to do other things with it than paying, um, you know, exorbitant salaries to people. All these things all of a sudden are suspect when someone else does it. And that's part of the American hubris. Mm -hmm. Um, and I th- actually, I think, you know, Frum's piece was was bad. I think Ann Applebaum's piece was, if possible, even worse. Mm-hmm. Give, give that one a read. <clears throat> Ann goes, you know, um, <clears throat> trotting down to Mexico, hangs out with the head of the INA in his office, Lorenzo Cordova, and then goes to the White March <clears throat> with um, one of the, you know, uh, one of the journalists who most, most hates AMLO there. And I think she has a real good time at that march. And then, you know, they head off to brunch, right? Um, and then she decides that Mexico is on the point of, of, of collapse. Based on those two voices alone, right? It, it, so it would be funny if it weren't. No, you're right. Yes, actually, because you have people like on one side, Dan Crenshaw and Mike Waltz, right? These, mm-hmm. you know. People who are saying we and <clears throat> bar saying we have to bomb the cartels, right? Mm-hmm. And we're going to use a force resolution to bomb the cartels, 
right? As if you can very easily just bomb a cartel without killing thousands of people, um, <clears throat> you know, causing untold uh, suffering and set on, setting off massive uh, migration flows. All right, we're going to play video games and and bomb the bomb the cartels. Now, some of that is political posturing. Fine. But then you have people like Bob Menendez on the other side giving bipartisan cover for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because Menendez, right, is buying into this, right? Um, this is setting back the clock on democracy and uh, and, and all of these things, sabotaging Mexico's democratic institutions, right? So what that does is all of a sudden it starts a little ball rolling, right? The Republicans want to bomb Mexico, so they've got an enemy. And the Democrats have a cause. <laughs> they have a cause so that they can feel morally superior, right? They want to save democracy from an autocrat. And they want to, you know, like Woodrow Wilson going down and intervening in the Mexican Revolution by occupying Veracruz. And how many thousands of Mexicans did they kill there, right? Um, they have a cause. And so what I'm worried is, is you have this kind of the most brutish element of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Them. And which is, I think, even worse, this kind of sermonizing, moralizing, establishment, liberal cause of saving democracy. And those two could create, you know, if we're not careful, a perfect storm for Mexico. Mm -hmm. right? right when, you know, between the Russia to China pivot, they could kind of sweep through um, Mexico. Now, do I think that's something that's likely or is going to happen tomorrow? No. Do I think it's possible? Well, yes. We saw Libya, we saw Syria, right? Uh, the United States has occupied uh, or uh, intervened in every country in Latin America over the course of history, and many of them multiple times, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or they're trying to provoke a color revolution from inside, right? This time color pink for the Ine, right? <laughs> All these white people wearing their pink hats so they don't get sunburned. Right. <laughs> Average age 77. <laughs> it's going to be hard to create a color revolution with that. But, you know, I, I, they can try. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I think it, I think it is something to be worried about. And like, you know, I, I want to be explicit about this. It's like obviously the Republicans are <clears throat> the, the, the the drum beaters like they're they're awful. Um, but so much of this also plays in when like the Democratic Party has control, at least of like the executive branch. And like, you know, here, like we have my governor in the state of Texas operating parallel border operations to the federal government. Right. Right. They, like drop the, the humanitarian stuff for a second. Right. Like that should infuriate Joe Biden. Right. And the, the, the sense that basically there's been silence on that is very worrying when, of course, you have Abbott who would love nothing more than, you know, to create some kind of incident or a Crenshaw who's definitely playing this up. You know, because he's trying to catch up because now he's a rhino. Uh, he's a Republican in name only, apparently, despite being mm -hmm. the most hawkish and psychotic. Repu I don't know. The Republican base will never be pleased. Um, but what's really amazing about these stories that you're getting in, like, you know, let's just be honest, like the liberal press, right? The Atlantic, the New York Times and stuff, um, is that there's all of these tears for Mexican democracy, right? And how it's under threat and the INE and all this kind of stuff. But like, I don't know, call me old fashioned. Right. But I think that like when you're talking about democracy, there's a voice that's very, very that's missing from this conversation, which is the people of Mexico who have regularly shown their support for one side. And, you know, the story is like very much something um, that is like meant for consumption by people far, far away who get no news, information or perspective um, from Mexico, um, apart from very, very well connected elites. And it's just like, I don't know, somebody who does like these kind of programs and we talk about, you know, other countries as well. Right. You always get one person just like, well, I'm this and I hate on Right. Or like I'm I'm from Peru and I think Pedro Castillo is, is dangerous or like I think evil Morales is a dictator. Right. It's like. Yeah, I mean, it makes it, it's not that surprising to me if you take like a, a sample of like people who are connected and, and are doing these kind of things in the United States, um, right? And maybe have a different <laughs> position on AMLO that might not be reflective of the vast majority of people, let alone like working class, poor people. My Venezuelan friend, right? Yeah, exactly. yes, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Says, yeah. Um, <clears throat> that's very, very true. I think that, you know, and what's interesting about Mexico is. Whereas most people from other South American countries in the United States, you know, those who get there are going to be from the middle and upper middle classes, right? 
mm-hmm. the wealthy. Mexico is an interesting case because the Mexican community in, in the United States are mostly working class. Mm-hmm. It's a phenomenon to Peru, Ecuador, Venezuela. The Mexicans in the United States are the ones who came looking for work, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And it's those Mexicans who overwhelmingly support AMLO in the United States. Totally. Overwhelmingly support AMLO. Like, you know, those anecdote, are the people anecdote, that- Anecdote, my personal yeah. experience here, when I talk to yeah. people um, from, from Mexico who live here now, like AMLO's good, right? But when yeah. I get comments on YouTube, when I get people oh, yeah. on Twitter, it's a different, different- it's a different demographic, isn't it? <laughs> and part of this, and part of what people hate about this electoral reform is that those Mexican migrants in the United States are now going to vote in presidential elections. Mm-hmm. They don't want that. They don't want that, right? It's like the Republicans don't want DC statehood, right? Well, Biden doesn't either, apparently. <laughs> So he wants it, but he also doesn't. He doesn't doesn't want it, right? That's what's underlying this. There is crude political calculation here, right? They don't want, you know, X millions of Mexicans to be able to vote in their consulate or in their embassy with their passports or with an official document, right? Mm. Because INE won't be there. Now, Mm -hmm. legitimate question as to how those, how that will work, right? But this is something in every country works out. Right. Every country has a mechanism for people who are living abroad to vote. Mm-hmm. Why can't Mexico have that? Why can't Mexico have a mechanism where the millions of migrants who, through no fault of their own, had to leave their country can participate in their electoral system? No, 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 no. That's one of the big things that's behind this. Right. Um, and I think that's something that isn't talked about. Right. The fact that they've enshrined into law um, minority quotas for for candidacies Mm -hmm. wasn't wasn't talked about. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, I go back again to the pretrial detention and and, and right to vote for people. Sometimes people in Mexico are in pretrial pretrial detention for years if they can't uh, if they can't um, pay for bail. They they can be in pretrial detention for years the way the justice system is Mm -hmm. and their political rights. Right. Shouldn't they be able to vote? Shouldn't they be able to participate politically? But these people don't count for the Ann Applebaums and the Frums of the world. People who are in prison, people who are migrants and want to vote. Right. Um, People who want to have access to candidacies from from gender and minority uh, positions. Right. That doesn't that doesn't enter into this. Right. What enters into this are the few restricted voices that the New York Times and the Atlantic listen to, yeah. which are friends of theirs, or people in think tanks, right? Like the Baker Institute there in Rice in Texas, or the Wilson Center, um, you know, or these other think tanks uh, hitched to US universities, which hire the most conservative upper class Mexicans, right? Give them a nice fat salaries, and then hook them up and connect them up to media. Mm-hmm. So that's always get the exact same people being um, interviewed uh, in U.S. media pieces, Jorge Castaneda, right, uh, Luis Rubio, um, Carlos Bravo Regidor, all the same people, they just recycle, they just recycle, recycle, recycle. They just need something on Mexico, let me grab somebody from the think tank, whatever else, ba, 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 and then, you know, you've got your piece. And that's why these pieces are so bad. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, I mean, again, they're, they're, they're truly sloppy. And look, look, there will be people in, in Mexico, there will be people who even listen to this thing and they'll say, like, I don't like AMLO, whatever. I would just say this. It's like, this is why you have a, a democracy. And it seems that when these questions are asked to the Mexican people, they line up on one side. And I think that that's <laughs> the people who are always ignored, right? As like they're being bamboozled or tricked by this, you know, magician from Tabasco. Um, we, we went a little over, but I did really want to ask you really quick, uh, Kurt. Sure. Because I think... Um, I, I sent it. I DM this to you when it happened, but there was this thing about Omlo, and um, I'm forgetting the, the 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 name there. But like it, him posting a picture of like you know allegedly like an elf, right? Oh, the Alusha. No? Yeah, yeah. And everyone had like a field day with it, which is like he's just like tweeting, having like fun. You know he's what I mean? Like, a good time. Really like the 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 and honestly, like the subtext of a lot of those attacks, I think, were really dark. Um, we're attacking his connection to indigenous traditions um, in Mexico. But apart from that, right, I don't even want to jump into that <laughs> that bog right now. 
I'm not surprised because I don't I see this happen all the time, but I was like frustrated when I was reading like the Reuters and AP um, coverage of that. The way that they describe um, <clears throat> this uh, train Maya, um, his, his almost quote pet project, you know, could you just give people who might not be familiar with what that is, like a sense of what that project is? Because the way that like English speaking American audience are being sort of, you know, what they're being told is that like crazy Omlo is like, you know, making a choo-choo train, Disney style, like choo-choo train and, you know, is wasting a bunch of money and is, um, you know, just like doing political theater. And I think it's worth it for people to have a little bit of context and understanding of, of what that project is. Sure. Um, so the train is called uh, the Maya train because it goes to the Yucatan Peninsula. Um, it's actually a very long, um, I think it's 2,000 kilometers around. It starts in uh, Palenque, um, the, uh, the Mayan ruins of Palenque, and it goes all the way through the Yucatan Peninsula and back. And the idea is to create uh, a train for tourists and also for locals and also for workers uh, to be able to... Um, you know, visit the whole network of, of sites in the Yucatan uh, mm -hmm. Peninsula, right? So it's, you know, it's a modern train with sleeping cars and, um, you know, a dining air car and, and nice, you know, a nice yeah. um, up there. Well, this was uh, one of AMLO's cardinal projects for the southeast of Mexico, which has traditionally not received investment. Yeah. <clears throat> investment has usually been uh, concentrated in Mexico City uh, and in the north, and the southeast has been uh, neglected. Um, it's worth to point out. It's worth pointing out that this is part of a of a plan to connect all of Mexico with trains by 20, 2050. Mm -hmm. It's to connect up all of them, all the country. Basically, they build a train network again. Mexico used to have a train network, but surprise, surprise, it was sold off in the privatizations of the nineties, largely under former President Ernesto Cedillo, who then joined the board of one of the companies that you know um, bought one of the privatized train networks, and then you know, ditched it, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mexicans used to travel on trains. Um, and so they're trying to rebuild a train network. Now, I think there's, we could have a whole other program on the Amaya train and, you know, there are voices that have, there are uh, concerns that it's going to uh, potentiate kind of the wrong kind of tourism, kind mm -hmm. of tourism of, oh, let's just go see the ruins and hop on a train rather than local tourism that helps local news groups. There's an argument to be made there. And I think that's very important, and I don't want to minimize that. But what you saw in that uh, piece in Reuters was this idea. I'm going to just posted this kind of a funny thing that way. Yeah. He was seeing the Maya train, and he's like, "We saw an Alusha in the tree." Alusha is kind of a <clears throat> kind of a mythic character in the Maya in the Maya tradition, mm -hmm. uh, and supposedly they only come out at night and they're spirit animals and whatever else, right? Uh, and he said Mexico is is mystical. Right. So you get this piece in Reuters that said um, the president appeared to be serious when he said this Alusha thing, like it was real. Right. And it is dark, like you say, because on one hand, they want to point out, point, paint Amlo as being an authoritarian dictator. On mm -hmm. the other hand, they want to paint him as being a mystical buffoon. Yep. During the pandemic, he mentioned at one point that somebody on one of his trips had given him a little image of the Virgen de Guadalupe, right? A little amulet. And he says, with my amulet, I'm protected from the, you know, from the pandemic, right? He was making a little off, you know, yeah. off the comment. And then all of a sudden it's, you know, mystical AMLO believes that you can um, <clears throat> ward off COVID with amulets because they're just, let's go back to the, the march, right? They're just Indians to the upper class Mexicans and to their American compatriots. They're just Indians. And of course, Indians would believe that you can ward off diseases with amulets. And of course, Indians believe in alushes uh, in trees because mm -hmm. they're just Indians, right? That's what they said at the opposition march. They're just Indians. So, mm -hmm. you know, what is it? What is he? Is he, is he a dictator or is he the buffoon or is he one or the other when it's convenient? Well, it's convenient. dehumanizing. Convenience is is the point here, and you know the reason I bring up the train is that like you should notice when something's convenient because like if David Fromm was somebody who was very consistent, for example, in like being worried about pipelines being built through indigenous lands and in, in the United States and like the environmental concerns, like that'd be one thing. 
But when it seems that like he is particularly outraged about Almo's investment <laughs> in, in the southeast of the country on those grounds, uh, it's probably because the wrong people are getting investment in, in David Frum's mind. Um, I think that's absolutely right. You know, if, if you you know have long term concerns about the environment and about indigenous rights in the Yucatan, those voices must be heard. But from all of a sudden, when it's convenient, is attacking Amlo from the left all of a sudden, right? David Frum, right? Well, he's not spending as much on social spending as he says he was, right? Mm -hmm. He's not on the left. Like David Frum is an expert on who's on the left and who isn't, right? Uh, I mean, it's just, really? It, Sorry. Whatever side, and you see this in Mexico all the time, too. People who are on the right pretending to be from the left and saying, Amlo isn't on the left because I know who's on the left and who isn't, right? We could have, if it were in good faith, a whole program as to what Morena is, right? Mm -hmm. Not socialist. Yes. Center left. Uh, and there are problems with Morena, right? But that requires a good faith discussion of saying, let's sit down and see what Morena is doing well, what it's not, what its philosophy is, right? And that's not what they're doing. Here, they're just finding whatever entry they can to hit. Yep. That's they're doing it's just mercenary politics at its worst so those people you can't even take seriously like mm -hmm. and write a considered response to them why or an apple bomb or you know no because the point isn't to be serious yes the point is simply to, this point is simply to hit it's they're just political hits and they're very clumsy political hits fortunately fortunately they're very clumsy right would they were you know more sophisticated we'd be having a more even a more serious problem Look, and like we, we, we've said this on, on Left Reckoning in the past, and like again, like you know, the point here is not that like AMLO is without criticism, as you just said. Like, look, I'm a, I'm a socialist, like, I don't necessarily see this like movement to be representative of like the kind of like socialist party movement that like I want to, to see, but when it's very, very clear that the right is basically just trying to attack the democratic process and the fact that poor working class yeah. people have some semblance of power. Lord knows I'm going to be standing with the person that they're being attacked, that's being attacked by, by these kind of ghouls. Right. And like, look, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's worthwhile being intellectually obvious about, I mean, honest about these things. Um, but it's very, very clear that like, if you do want any kind of opening for maybe like a more radical pro politics or more socialist politics, it's not going to come from like a fervent opposition to AMLO and the Morana project, pro, um, project, but like recognizing what it represents, representing where it, understanding where it can go and pushing back against these attacks from, um, you know, the David Frums, the Atlantic and the New York Times on a project um, that has achieved a significant amount for people and is opening up a lot of doors for positive change in Mexico. Yeah, I agree with that. You know, it's 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 the it's this idea of of critical support. Right. Yeah. And it's it's where the people it's where being where the movement is mm -hmm. at, 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 at the moment. Right. Um, <clears throat> you know, I would remind people that the history of Latin America is not socialist utopias. Mm -hmm. The history of Latin America is governments being overthrown by coups that even try to make moderate change. That's the history of Latin America. So I think we have to situate ourselves in the continent we're in. Mm -hmm. Right. The history of Latin America is governments. That have that did even less than AMLO has done, getting overthrown, like that. Mm -hmm. In the past, right, fortunately times have changed, and so I would conclude <clears throat> by <clears throat> saying to the American left: if you're interested in Mexico, if you're interested in Latin America, if you're interested in anti-imperialism and anti-interventionism uh, and socialist internationalism, now is the time. <clears throat> now is the time to stand up for Mexico. Yes, that's the time on social media and in, in uh, DSA meetings um, <clears throat> and workplaces where there, you know, we have might have Mexican uh, work colleagues, right? There's, there's a cross ethnic, you know, Mex this is a cross border working class between, you know, Mexicans in the US and Mexicans in Mexico. Um, you see that most of the people in the strikes in the US over the last few years are Spanish speakers, mostly women. Um, large Mexican representation to be talking about these things with your coworkers, to be talking about these pieces, to be getting the word out there. There's a great project called the Mexico Solidarity Project that is working uh, <clears throat> on this because it seems like a joke that they could bomb Mexico, but it's 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 it's, it's a joke until it happens. And I think socialists, this is the this is the time to be active on this. 
this is this is the time right now. I would I would I put that put that out the that out there to people. No, I mean, thank you so much. And I, I totally agree. I mean, look, um, I'm like an internationalist. I think it's great that we're, we show solidarity with Lula. I think it's great that we show solidarity with Jeremy Corbyn. We should get a lot better and a lot more well versed in what's happening uh, to to our neighbors in, in, in Mexico and really build a, a serious you know coalition of, of working class people and, and, and have that be first and foremost in, in a lot of the things that we're doing. Kurt, as always, appreciate talking with you on Left Reckoning. Really was happy that you were able to join me this week on Give Them an Argument. Um, there are links uh, to Kurt's piece in Jacobin. Y'all should follow Kurt on Twitter as well uh, to keep abreast on all these things. Uh, really appreciate it, brother. And uh, I hope, I'm, I'm sorry if it went a little long, but I always, I, I always really do enjoy talking to you. <laughs> I feel like I do it for a couple more. No, it's my pleasure. I really appreciate the time to have this kind of considered conversation about what's going on in Mexico. I really appreciate the, the time and the invitation always. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>